All right, so New York City Code Camp, how's everything going today? You guys feeling good? I'm glad you're all here. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I haven't been in New York in, in a couple years, so it's always an experience for me being from uh, uh, Columbus, Ohio, to come to a city like New York and just overwhelming. <laughs> Uh, it's not made for tall guys really either. It's sort of a, a tiny, cramped city in, in, in one sense of the word, anyway. So here we are in Code Camp, New York City. This is kind of for my benefit to know where I am, but uh, also for the recording. Um, just so you guys know, who are watching at home on YouTube, uh, where we are, you can go to this link and find more information. Come on out here next time they have a camp. Here's some information about me, if I can get the slide to work. I'm Matthew Groves, I work for Couchbase, so that's your disclaimer. As far as NoSQL goes, I'm a little biased towards Couchbase. Um, I'm a, I have a Twitter account there, M. Groves. I also run a podcast and a blog at crosscuttingconcerns.com. I would love to have you guys as a guest on my podcast. Very short, 10, 15 minutes. Just uh, come see me or go to the website and just submit a form. Anything you want to talk about with technology, I would love to have you on the show. Um, I'm not an expert on NoSQL. Or anything really, but I'm enthusiastic about it. That's, that's really my job, is to be enthusiastic about technology and to tell you guys about it and help you guys get started and try things out. So uh, feel free to stop me anytime with questions. If it's a really broad or deep question, I may have you come talk to me afterwards or I may refer you to somebody else who is an expert afterwards, but feel free to stop me anytime you'd like. Okay, so as far as uh, Couchbase goes, I want to get this out of the way right up front because it always comes up. Uh, Couchbase and CouchDB are not the same thing. They share an acronym. Uh, they share some early history. Some of the same people contributed to both pieces of software, but they are not a fork of each other. They're not, one's not a commercial version of each other or anything like that. They're two different things. They are both NoSQL databases. They share an acronym. Let's leave it at that. Uh, CouchDB is Apache Foundation and Couchbase is Couchbase Incorporated. Uh, during the session, if you get bored, tweet something interesting that you've learned or a picture and put a hashtag Couchbase. Uh, if you do so, I'll bribe you with some very cool stickers um, that you can come see me afterwards to get, or if you're just really nice and want a sticker, I'll, I'll give you one. Do this so my boss knows I'm not here screwing around. Just hashtag Couchbase. Okay, we're talking about full stack with .NET and NoSQL. So right off the bat, some of you guys you know who you are, might have a problem with some of these buzzwords up here. And I'm, I'm with you on this. Some of these are very buzzwordy marketing terms. Uh, full stack, for instance. We're not writing drivers. We're not writing operating systems or I.O. code, right? So we're not writing the full, full stack. What we're writing is the, is the application stack, right? The UI, business logic, database, and maybe some deployment automation or uh, some DevOps type work, right? So, but full stack's kind of a shortcut to say that. The other one is NoSQL. This is a term that I have a love-hate relationship with because I work for a NoSQL company. Um, but it's a term that describes what something isn't. So it's only really useful up to a point. And in fact, I'm going to show you later today that the SQL part is becoming less and less accurate uh, when it comes to NoSQL databases. So if I went with the more descriptive, more accurate, less buzzwordy title, it would be something like this. And this is usually too long for the uh, text fields on submission forms, so um, I don't go with that. But this is uh, much more accurate and uh, much less zippy. Okay? So if you have a problem with those buzzwords, I'm with you. But they are shortcuts and they help us communicate, so we're, I'm going to keep using them. Full stack developer, like I said, you're working on the, uh, the front end, the UI. The database, working with the back end, uh, you're doing some infrastructure, some DevOps stuff, maybe even mobile stuff is in here. So if you're somewhere around the middle of these circles, you wear a lot of different hats, this is you. This is the full stack developer. Anybody in here like that at all? Uh, one? I'm sure a lot of you guys wear more hats than you, you give yourselves credit for. So uh, that's what a full stack developer means, in, in, not, in my mind anyway. Some people think, oh, you use the same language across the whole stack, and, and you know, that's fine. But I think as long as you're working with all those things, or most of those things, you're a full stack developer. And what do I mean by stacks in the first place? So you guys may have seen these acronyms before describing sort of the traditional stack and sort of the newer stack in terms of web development, so LAMP and MEAN. Um, the individual tools in these stacks aren't 
terribly important in my view. You know, uh, LAMP is Linux, Linux Apache, MySQL, PHP. But if you're doing traditional .NET development, you're, you're doing that. It's just SQL Server instead of MySQL, or it's C Sharp instead of PHP, etc. And the main stack is Mongo Express Angular Node, which is sort of JavaScript all the way up and down. But more importantly, it represents a, a, a different paradigm shift in how we write UIs and how we write the server-side code. And so those are the sort of two catchy acronyms you'll see. Uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about this, this neuro style stack here on the right. So why is NoSQL, in this case Mongo, or in my case Couchbase, why is that part of the more modern data, or the more modern stack we're talking about? And I, I think there's lots of reasons, but one of them is that with the newer stacks, you're typically writing API endpoints that return some piece of JSON data, a JSON document. And so if you're using a relational database, you're often taking the same set of tables over and over, joining them together, and spitting out something like this. So some people said, well, why don't we just store this instead of having to go through all this stuff here? And this will give us some uh, additional flexibility in terms of developing our schema and some other benefits as well in terms of scaling and availability and some cool stuff like that. So that's why you see often, a lot of the times you see a NoSQL database as part of these newer stacks. When is NoSQL a good fit? I'm sure it's a question on a lot of your minds. I don't have a silver bullet answer for you. Um, if you're looking for that, I'm sorry, there isn't one. Uh, the, you know, this, it's a good fit in those modern apps, those, those web and mobile and IoT apps where you, know, you need some flexibility. And in your legacy business apps, you know, it's, a, it's a small internal app or you really, really need that full ACID support or transactions. Those are really, really important to you. Um, maybe uh, SQL is the answer. But again, there is no silver bullet here. These are not hard and fast rules, right? So uh, my friend Jim Holmes, often he says, the only best practice is to use your brain. Uh, so, you know, I, you may think that uh, no SQL is not a good fit, but I would, I would just suggest you give it a try. See what you think, and then go from there. It may not be a good fit for what you're working on right now, but it may be a good fit for something you're working on in the future. And uh, if you want to know more about that, I ha there's, uh, Couchbase has put out this uh, top 10 use cases white paper based on some real, um, real use cases that our customers have been using, why they're using NoSQL, and the, you know, what the benefits are for them over relational databases, and so on. Uh, so uh, go check that out if you want to read more into that detail there and uh, make a case to why you should try NoSQL or switch to NoSQL or, or add NoSQL to your project. I'm going to talk mostly about Couchbase today as the NoSQL portion. And Couchbase is a distributed database, which means it runs not just on a single machine, but on a bunch of machines clustered together. And that enables you to, uh, add, to scale it out quite easily. And we also have the NoSQL part, which means that your schema is flexible. It's not a fixed, rigid schema as a relational database would uh, impose on you. Couchbase is cool because it has a built-in managed cache layer in RAM, which gives us a lot of speed. We can interact with RAM directly instead of having to go to disk every time for reading and writing a document. Uh, it can act as a simple key value store. I just wrote a blog post on this. You can store whatever you want as the value and uh, you know, some unique key and you can just fetch values, really basic values like that. But the cool thing about Couchbase is the document database part, where you're storing JSON documents. Because when we store JSON, Couchbase can reason about those documents and can do some server-side stuff with them. We'll see a little bit of that today. I don't have a lot of time today to talk about the mobile stuff Couchbase has, but it's very cool, you should check it out. I'll have some links for you near the end if you want to look into that more. I'm glad to answer any questions for you. Couchbase likes to say we provide agility and scale. Uh, we talked about a lot of this stuff already. Um, the flexible modeling, um, the development's pretty easy and straightforward. We can do some migration and some mobile stuff. And scale, is, like I said, it's a cluster, so you can just rack up additional servers and scale out when it's like a busy time of the year and then scale back down when it's not so busy, save some money. This is a feature people like a lot, is multi-data center. So you can have a data center in the United States and one in Europe, and you can sync between them and provide some geographical availability there. Uh, some enterprise-grade security, what you'd expect. I'm going to talk about .NET today. 
Couchbase provides SDKs for a lot of other languages and uh, frameworks, so uh, chances are if you're coding in it, we have an SDK for it. Uh, Java, JavaScript, Node, so on. I'm going to be using Windows today. Uh, actually, I'm going to be using Docker for Windows today, but we have a Windows, Mac, and uh, Linux versions out there, so your OS is covered for your development work. Um, I'm using Web API from ASP.NET today, uh, but if you're using Nancy or MVC or some other ASP.NET framework, it should work fine with those. No, no problems there. Uh, anybody in here into big data, big data tools? All right, a couple. So uh, Couchbase has a lot of integrations with some of these uh, popular big data tools. These are some that our customers are using or at least trying out. Uh, for instance, I think LinkedIn uses Kafka as, a, as one of their big data tools. Um, so these are definitely cool if you're into big data. I'm not going to talk about that much, but definitely some tools out there for you. Couchbase's architecture is, I think, the most interesting thing about Couchbase. So was anybody here for the Mongo session last, uh, last hour? Okay, cool. So I think you're going to see some contrast between, between Couchbase and Mongo. Um, one of the things most interesting is that a Couchbase node is equally important as any other node in the cluster. So there's no master slave, there's no primary, secondary. They're, they're all sort of of equal importance in a cluster. And you know, everyone's DevOps, so I just want to you know, touch on this stuff a little bit here. I don't want to go into it too much. But we have these services up here, Data Query Index, that you know, build and maintain indexes and also execute queries. Uh, figure out the query plans and so on. Every node does some caching and storage. The cluster manager is what you'll be working with as a developer. You'll be communicating with that cluster manager most of the time. And there's, some other, there's another service that's not here because it's in developer preview, so I'm not going to go over it. Here's a screenshot of the console uh, that comes with Couchbase. It just whenever you spin up Couchbase, you can open this up in a browser and you can see information about uh, Couchbase, uh, you know, some of the uh, performance information, how much RAM, disk space you're using. Uh, you can drill that. We'll see more of this in action later, but you can get some information about that. That comes right out of the box with Couchbase Server. And for additional administration stuff, there's a REST API. So if you want to write some scripts that communicate to the Couchbase cluster or individual nodes, you can just, uh, you know, this is just a portion of it. There's a whole long list of REST API endpoints you can use to interact with Couchbase. Okay, so. That's enough about Couchbase architecture. Let's talk about how to actually uh, get and store data in Couchbase and how it works. So the, the most simple way, a lot of NoSQL databases uh, do this, is that you can say, OK, I want a document, and here's the key for the document. So I'm saying, I want K2. And Couchbase says, OK, here's K2, and I'll give you that document back. So you just fetch something by a key, and it gives you back a JSON document. This is really the, the fastest operation in Couchbase. It usually gets it from RAM. Yeah, question? So it saves as in a, a thing as a document, or it says everything is an XML node or text-based? So your question is everything is saved as a JSON document? Yes. Yes, that's correct. And it has a unique ID, a unique ID as Yeah, everything has a unique ID. So each document, so here's a document, and then each document has a unique key. You, the key can be whatever you want it to be. You know, I'm going to use GUIs, I think, in this demo, but you can use something else, whatever you want to as a key. It has to be unique within a, what we call a bucket, which I'll touch on that in a minute here. Okay? Uh, a second way to do it, uh, also common for NoSQL databases, is called a map reduce. It's where you write some code to uh, basically loop over the documents inside of a bucket, and you can map some fields from them. So here I have a person document. I want to just map some fields, the name and age, for instance. So I'm mapping those. That's my map function. But I can reduce them. I can say, OK, amongst those results, give me just the ones that have age over 21. So I'm writing two different functions there, the map and reduce. And I write those in Couchbase's case, I write them in JavaScript. And they're stored in the, or in the Couchbase cluster. So it's a map reduce. It's pretty common amongst you know, big data and NoSQL databases. Um, it's pretty powerful for some custom aggregations, some, some cool things you can do with that. One thing that Couchbase has that I think is relatively unique amongst NoSQL databases is that you can write SQL for it. 
And we actually call it uh, nickel, N1QL, because SQL itself isn't really enough to work with JSON documents. So we have to add some additional stuff to it. So this is a superset of SQL called nickel. So I could, for instance, write this query here, select star from a bucket, which we'll more on what a bucket is later, where the age is greater than 21, it'll go here and run that query and give me the results back, Steve and Melissa. So anybody in here know how to write SQL? <laughs> a few of you? Yeah, so you can use a NoSQL database with SQL. This is why that NoSQL name is becoming sort of less meaningful. Question? Yeah, go ahead. So in this um, nickel query, yes. you're saying the age is greater than what is it looking inside the JSON documents? Yes. So there's a field named age in these documents. It'll set, check that, see if it's greater than 21. So does the SQL convert automatically to text-based search? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by text. But these data, this data is, is saved as JSON, yes. right? So this, this nickel is executed by the query service to look at the fields in JSON. Right, so if there's a, if there's a field named age, it would look at that field. So yeah. The K1, K2, that's the primary key in this case, right? Uh, so I wouldn't know if it's like called primary key, but it is the document key. Yes. You, yes, no, you, you have to have at least an index on these keys. You can also index the fields in the JSON documents as well, which is very important, which we'll get to that later. Very important for performance. So I probably want to index the age field, for instance. So, so many questions. Uh, I'll go back there, yeah. Is it uh, type safe? Like, let's say if you store for whatever reason uh, age as a string, yeah. do you recognize that? Um, I so the question is, is it type safe? If age was stored as a string, would it recognize that? And I believe the answer is, uh, well, the answer is I don't know. We can try it if you want to try it later. I, I don't think, I think it'll work how you expect it to, but uh, JSON's kind of weird, so maybe not. There's another question over here somewhere, yeah. Do you do anything to enforce schema, or if a document doesn't have a particular field, do you just ignore it? Right, so the question is, do you do anything to enforce schema? No. Uh, you can put any do adjacent document you want in this bucket. And the second question is, what happens basically if this field isn't there? And so that's, this is what, how that, uh, that superset comes into play of nickel. Because in SQL, a column is either there or it's not there, right? It's an error if it's not there. With JSON, we have some additional syntax to say, is this column missing, or a field? Is this field missing, or is it not missing? So I could add in an another one here. Well, in this case, I don't need to, because if age isn't there, it's just going to not return that row. But I could say where age is not missing, for instance. And then, and age greater than 21. Or if I wanted to find documents where there was no age, I could say where age is missing. It would turn me up those documents. More questions, goodness. Uh, can you enforce the JSON uh, schema for this collection? Can you enforce the JSON schema for this collection? Yes. Couchbase will not enforce that schema. So you're going to have to, if you want to enforce the schema, you have to do that in your application. OK. Wow, OK. I really like this, guys. I really like you asking so many questions. Really great to have a very interactive uh, group here. OK. Um, so uh, we get uh, a lot of SQL stuff. Uh, select, insert, delete, update, uh, joins, merge, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's some powerful stuff to handle JSON, which I mentioned already. And for whatever reason, if you need them, there's ODBC and JDBC drivers available. I would suggest you not use those in your app, but if you need to integrate with some other tool like Excel or Crystal Reports or whatever, you can use those drivers. OK, let's talk about some .NET now. There's a Couchbase .NET SDK available on NuGet. Uh, oh, you know what? This slide is out of date, because as of yesterday, there is a .NET Core SDK available. It's a developer preview, but it's available on NuGet. And uh, so you can, it's compatible with full .NET Framework or .NET Core, and they're on NuGet for you. So once you install that with, uh, with NuGet, assume you have a Couchbase instance running, probably locally like I do have with Docker. Here's some namespaces you could add to use Couchbase. I use ReSharper, so namespaces usually just appear when I, when I uh, summon them. But just for the record, these are the namespaces you'd like to you use for Couchbase. Here's some snippets of how you interact with Couchbase. So up there at the top, the first three lines, that's how you connect to a Couchbase cluster. You say, give me a new client configuration, and then you tell it 
where the nodes in the cluster are. Now, in this case, I only have one node running locally, because I'm just doing development. I'm not, I'm not, you know, this is not a production app that I'm, I'm working on. But if I had a bunch of nodes, I'd probably want to list them all there. Now, you don't have to do that, but it's a good practice to list all the nodes there in case something happens, your app resets, or a node goes down, it can recover by connecting to another node in the cluster. And then cluster helper got initialized, and then you can use the cluster helper from that point on to get access to couch-based data. So for instance, if I want to get access to a bucket, I can say cluster helper dot get bucket and give it that bucket name. Now a bucket is that collection of documents that each have a unique key within that bucket. Generally speaking, the rule of thumb is we recommend about one bucket per application. Now you don't have to follow that rule, that's just a guideline to give you an idea of what you should put in a bucket, right? And then uh, you can put a password on the bucket, too, if you'd like. Uh, now, if I wanted to prepare a nickel query, for instance, I could say query request.create, and I'll show you some examples later on about how you can parameterize that, because guess what? SQL injection can be possible in a NoSQL database. Uh, but anyway, select star from, and this is just the back ticks for the bucket name in there to select all the documents there. And then finally, to create and save a document, I can say new document of whatever type. I'm put dynamic in here because I'm super lazy. I don't want to have to define a whole class on this same slide. But you could put a class in there, a plain old CLR object. That would be fine. ID is whatever you want. Uh, in this case, it's a string. But you could put a GUID. Well, it has to be a string. But you can make it a GUID to a string or you know, compose some complex key, whatever you want to do. And then content, this is whatever object I want to serialize to JSON and store in Couchbase. So I'm just doing an anonymous object here because, again, super lazy. But I could just say, you know, new person and then define that object there. And then bucket.insert document. And that's it. You've stored that document in Couchbase. Question. I knew it. You recommend one bucket per application. So roughly. Roughly. So then this bucket is going to have all sorts of disparate JSON objects that have nothing to do with each other, right? So the question is, are these going, is this bucket going to have a bunch of different types of documents? The answer is yes. And there's no way to enforce any kind of meaningful uniqueness, say, I don't want two employees in there that have the same first name and last name. Right. Yes, that, so you can, there's no unique constraint on those documents, correct. One, one thing a lot of people do is they will put like another field in here called type. Type <laughs> equals person. So in that way you can sort of differentiate the documents from each other. So this is a person document. This is a... I don't know, a building document. And this is an invoice document, right? So that's one way you can do it. It's not required. There's nothing magical about a type field. It's just something that people do to maybe they index that field, use it in queries, help differentiate documents from each other. OK? We'll see some more code samples here. In fact, uh, almost right away. This is, uh, I just want to go through this query real quick, just to, again, sort of review how it works to execute a query a nickel query in Couchbase. So um, this example, I've gone with synchronous methods, but asynchronous is also possible. It's just using query. Instead of using query here, I use query async. But I don't want to, um, you know, some people aren't too comfortable with awaiting async, so I want to keep it simple for now. Um, but I say, OK, query request.create with the, with the nickel string. And then I say bucket.query. And this is the type that I expect those documents to get mapped into when I execute the query. So because I'm lazy, I went with dynamic, but I could, could put a regular type in there like person or invoice, and it would map the document fields to that C-sharp object. All right, and then I get results, and results can have things like, uh, was it successful? Was there an error? What was the error, et cetera? And it also has a rows, which is a, which I don't know why they say rows, because they're not rows, but um, it's a list of dynamic in this case. So I'll be returning a list of dynamic. OK? We'll get, again, we'll get more complex in this later on, but I just want to sort of you know, gradually work you into it, get you comfortable with it. Uh, you know what? I had a whole bunch of slides to go through this one by one, and I didn't do that. So I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, I'll skip those over there real fast. So let's do a quick demo. I've written an ASP.NET app that uses a sort of full stack with Angular and um, Web API. And I just want to demo it for you here real quick, and we'll get into some of the code. So right here, I've got a, this is a very, very complex app where I'm adding people. 
my first name, last name, email, and then I can edit them and delete them. Very, very complex. So I hit the new item here, and I'll say, okay, I'm Matt Groves, and I'm Matthew.Groves at Couchbase.com. Hit save, and oh, it appears in the list. Amazing. Okay, we'll do another one that says delete me, uh, delete at delete me dot gov, save. Okay, now I've got two persons in there. All right, go ahead and edit a person, and say Matt Groves. All right, and so those edits have happened there. You can see in the, uh, the row, and I can go ahead and delete, and there's no confirmation because. Again, I'm really lazy, but typically you want to pop up and say, are you sure you want to delete this? But I deleted the row, and there we go. So that's the basic CRUD app that I'm showing you today. It's just a very small Angular UI and then a very small web API backend. So any questions on that so far before I start showing you some of the code? So everyone understands this is a pretty simple CRUD app here. Good. Okay, so uh, the, the stack what I'm using, uh, typically you see this mean stack here with NoSQL Express Angular Node. The .NET world, I'm, I'm just sort of substituting in Web API for Express and ASP.NET IIS for Node. We don't have quite the same zippy acronym as, as mean, right? We have QA or a walk. So if you guys have a good idea for an acronym, let me know because that's, that's not catchy enough, you know, maybe. What? Kawa? Kawa? I don't know. I got nothing. But So the way this works is that Angular sits on the front end, does all the UI work. This is where the templates are. This is where the markup, the CSS, JavaScript, everything is over here. And then the back end is just web, web API. So we're not doing any Razor templates or nothing like that. It's just returning data via the endpoints, via JSON. So the only thing that couples these together is those URLs and the format of data that it expects to be passed back and forth. So hypothetically, you could switch this out for Angular 2 or React or whatever and keep the same back end or vice versa. Now that's definitely hypothetical, but more realistically, we could take that same API and use it on our web app, in our mobile app, in our, I don't know, Steam app or whatever. We can reuse that same backend. So if I make a purchase here on a Steam.com website, or what is it, Steam Powered or whatever, and if I go to my Steam app, it'll show up in there, because I'm using the same API. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you Angular 1 today. Angular 2 has been a bit of a, a bear for us trying to write code samples, because they keep changing the darn thing. But uh, Angular 2 samples will be out shortly, and um, you can look for those on the GitHub that I'll give you later. So I'm just kind of going to scratch the surface of Angular today, if that's okay. If anybody here use Angular 1? Okay, so I apologize for my Angular demo code. It may not be the prettiest thing. But this is kind of what it will look like here. This is a function to get all the person objects, all the person documents from, uh, from an endpoint. So I'm just saying, call this fetch all, and I'm saying, okay, get this endpoint here, API get all, and then when that's successful, I'm using a promise here, I loop through the items and I put them into an array. This ID is the key, the document key, and then this, this is this the document itself. So then once I have this items, I can then use that in the markup to show you the items like I did in that, uh, in that demo there. All right, and then uh, if I want to do a save, I'm just going to save a document with three fields, first, last, and email. I'm going to make a post to this API save method. And the data is what I'm going to pass to that as the document. So I'm just going to map these one by one, first name, last name, email. And then if we have a document ID, so if this is doing an edit, for instance, pass that document ID here, so it knows that we're updating an existing document, not creating a new one. If we're creating a new one, this is going to be you know, undefined or null or something. And so we're expecting our REST endpoint to handle that case of this either being a new or updated document. OK? Everyone clear on the Angular stuff so far? Cool. OK. Now let's look at the back end. We'll start with the most exciting part of any web API back end, which is the web.config file. So I've added a couple of keys here, Couchbase Server and Couchbase Bucket. 
Um, you know, this is probably more verbose than it needs to be. It could just be couchbase colon slash slash localhost. I'm running it on Docker locally, but that could be, you know, whatever, wherever your couchbase cluster lives or wherever a node lives. And then uh, a bucket name, which I've called restful sample, actually I think is default is what I'm using today. So, but you can name your buckets whatever you want to. So that's a web.config. Really exciting, right? Okay, then uh, the next most exciting part is globalasax.cs. These first five lines, I'm sure you've seen a million times. That's what you get when you say file new. So nothing new there. This part here is, we've kind of seen this before. We're setting up cluster helper here, initializing that with the config object. And with the config object, I'm just saying here is where the, the node is for Couchbase, and that's pulling it from the web config file that I just showed you. Again, just one node because I'm running it locally, just in the Docker container. Why would you have multiple? Uh, so uh, if you want to scale out Couchbase to have multiple nodes, you would want to list all those nodes here, right? And uh, so it's not a copy of the data. It's, it's going to be a cluster. So it's going to distribute the data amongst those nodes. So it's going to provide automatic sharding. It's going to put the data on nodes. And it's not round robin. It's using a hashing method to decide which node it goes on. So it's going to spread that data out amongst those nodes. So the logic for spreading the data out is built into Couchbase. You don't have to worry about that at all. It's handled automatically. OK. And then to clean up, you'd say cluster helper.close and the application.end, just to make sure you're disposing the connections properly and so on. OK. All right, now let's get to the good stuff here. I'm going to start by writing a Web API controller. Anyone familiar with Web API yet? A couple? All right. Anybody familiar with uh, ASP.NET MVC? More familiar with that one? Okay. So it's, it's kind of similar to MVC. It's a dif different uh, thing, but, but similar. So I'm creating a controller. It's inheriting from API controller instead of normal controller. And I've got this uh, record model class here, which I haven't shown you yet, but we're, we're going to create that in a second. I'm just going to instantiate that in the constructor. You probably want to use an IOC container or dependency injection for this, but I'm keeping it simple by just saying a new record model. OK, so that model is going to be available to the rest of our uh, endpoints in this controller. So here is the save endpoint. We showed you the Angular code for this before. It's going to post a person to this endpoint. And Web API is going to bind that to a person object for us. So that's one of the cool things I like about Web API is, is the model binding. Doing some very simple validation here just for the heck of it making sure that first name, last name, and email were all passed in. Otherwise, we're going to return a 400 with a message saying that you, know, you need to have those fields in there. And this is using async, by the way, which, again, you don't have to do that. Um, you can just use asynchronous to keep it simple. But then I return an OK, and I'm just going to await, because this is asynchronous, the save method on the record model, which we haven't written yet. I'm going to show you in a bit. But that is all that's in the endpoint right now. Validation, and then uh, you know, call that uh, repository, call that, that data access layer. OK, with me so far? Here is the git. This is to get a single person based on their ID. And so again, we're just doing some basic validation. And then I probably should take most, all this async and wait stuff out. But um, get by the document ID, pass the document ID into that. So these endpoints are very, very simple. We want to keep them simple. We don't want a big, noisy endpoint. We want to just, just direct traffic, take in the data, do something with it, and then return a response. Uh, here's a delete. So we're passing in the whole person object in this case. And we're just saying, well, it must have an ID. Otherwise, we don't know what to delete. And then delete that document. You're seeing a pattern here yet. Very simple uh, API, web API endpoints. OK, so let's go over to the record model class. This is where we're actually interacting with NoSQL. And uh, you know what? I left some more asynchronous stuff in. That's fine. You guys comfortable with async, await? Anybody, anybody here OK with that? OK, all right. So I'm just saying, just give me an, create a new document. The ID is going to be, this is some sort of newer C-sharp syntax. 
C sharp six, the question mark dot there. Anybody not seen that one so far or not familiar with that one? So you guys are all comfortable with that one? Wow, that's a first. Okay, cool. Uh, so then it's checking to see if that document is null. If it's if it's is null, then I want to just go ahead and create a new key because now we're creating a new document in our database. I'm going to map these one by one to an anonymous object. Um, you don't have to do it. I could just pass data directly into content. That would be fine. But if someone changes that person class, maybe I don't want to map that into the database just yet. So I have to consciously decide to map these fields over there. That's up to you. And also appending this type equals user, like I mentioned earlier. Just hard coding that this is a document where the type equals user. It's a field that, that's going to be always going to be in there. And then bucket upsert is a combination of insert and update. So if the document already exists, it's going to update it. If it doesn't exist, it's going to insert it. It just goes off the key. Um, for those of you not comfortable with that C-sharp syntax, this is the wordier version, not using any of those question marks. The same thing, though. OK, any questions on that? Um, I have a question. Sure. I'm relatively new to NoSQL. OK. Right. Not a typical relational right. So the question is, is there a reason you have GUID as an ID? Uh, I use GUID just because it was easy to do. You can make the key anything you want to. <coughs> um, you can put a string in there, a number, whatever you'd like to put in there as the key. So the auto generation works. There, there's no auto generation okay. um, of keys. So you have to use something like uh, a GUID. Yeah, so that, that's one, one way you can do it, is with a GUID. You can use a random string or some other composite, composite uh, string, whatever you like to do. Some people use different things to enable um, relationships, things like that. Was there another question right there? That was a question. Okay. No, there's not. Okay, cool. So once I uh, save document, here's how it would look and when I go to the Couchbase console. I bring up that document. There's the key right there. It's just a GUID. And then here's the document itself, which is a very simple JSON object with those uh, four fields in it. Macroves and Macroves at Couchbase. That's correct. Instead of row and column, it's saving as a document. Right. Yeah. You can, you can kind of think of it as a, a table with two columns. Like this is the one column, this is the other column. Right? It would be, be kind of a weird way to think of it, but you could. But because we, you know, this is a, it's just Couchbase understands JSON, it can, it can look at this value and, and reason about it more than just any random value that's put in there. So the question, yeah, can we, we can, we can, Couchbase understands that this is a field that we can you know, write queries against and, and things like that, right? I could, sorry? Can you have a combination for the keys? Uh, in what in what sense? Oh, oh, okay. A composite. So a composite key. Now you, you you can you could put something in here with like a delimiter. Some people do like person colon colon you know GUID. So they know that this you know it's one way to say oh this is a person document because it has person as part of the key. So you could invent your own sort of composite key in there. But, but for, from Couchbase's point of view, it's a string. Yes, there's a limit to the key length. Um, I don't know what it is offhand. It's like 100, 100 to 200 characters, something like that. So I'm not exactly sure. Don't quote me on that. There's a limit to the document as well. I think that's 20 meg, something like that. Yeah? If you were to do something like that, like person, column, column, and then grid, yeah. do you uh, search by the key, like do it contains person? Yeah. So, right, so the question was, if I, you know, can I do a, a query, basically, um, against that key to see if the key contains a certain string, and the answer is yes. And I'm not going to show that exactly, but you'll, you, I think you get the idea here once I go a little uh, further down with more examples here. Okay, so let me show off a little bit of really basic nickel here. This is the get by document ID method in that record model. And what this function is taking in is a GUID. So we want to find the document that has that GUID. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a very simple nickel query. Give me the first name, last name, and email from the bucket name, which is, I guess, uh, default in my case. I'm going to alias that bucket name as users. 
you can alias it a bucket just like you can a table in SQL. And then I, I do this meta, which is unique to nickel, give me some metadata about the documents I'm querying. And one of those is the key. So to your question, this is what you perform the like against or the equals, something like that. And then parameterizing it. And so then I create that query, add the parameter, which is document ID. You don't want to add it directly into the string because you open yourself up to a SQL injection. And then query it and get, return the rows. Now, uh, I said early on that there is a, a way to access documents just based on the key. You can do a, a bucket.git and pass in the key, which is going to be faster than running a nickel query. But I'm just trying to demonstrate nickel, just trying to show it off a little bit, some of the basics here. So I wouldn't recommend you do this exact thing in your app. Do a bucket.git instead. But I'm just trying to show off the, the query syntax. Yeah. Uh, so, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the alias. Users is the alias of the bucket, which I could I could call whatever I wanted to. I could say you, and then this is the I'm just using the alias here again. Right. Yeah. Same one. Yeah. Same one. I could, it, it, this was you. That would be you as well. Yeah. So it's just a convenience thing. Yeah. All the way back. Okay. So if you have multiple versions of the same document, um, so I mean, I'm not sh quite sure how, what you're getting at there, uh, but. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, you can't have, the, the documents can't have the same key, right? So you'd have to maybe do some variation on that key. So you could say, you know, GUID, uh, comma, one, GUID, comma, two. That might be one way you could do it. Um, you could probably, you could maybe store the old versions in uh, some other bucket, perhaps. If you, that might be a good case for using multiple buckets in an application. Uh, that's going to depend on, uh, you know, what's easy for your particular use case there. Okay? Oh, okay. Uh, who's first? Uh, over here. Um, on the query, if you, um, when you say select first name, last name, and email, yeah. if there are some object, JSON objects stored that don't have an email, yeah. but have a first name and a last name, mm -hmm. since you casted it as a C-sharp dynamic object, Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so two questions here baked in is that, uh, if I select first name, last name, email, and the document doesn't have email, what the query is going to return is basically it's going to say email undefined. We don't have an email value, so we can't return that. All right? Now, when you map that to a C-sharp object, um, it's going to be kind of like a null. Probably is how that would be mapped in C-sharp is to a null. Right? So if I had a person object that was first name, last name, and email, I would get you know, Matt Groves, and then email is null. Okay. Now, I, I think probably baked into your question is another question about if I have first name, last name, email, but my object only has email, what happens to first name and last names? Basically, they don't get put into the object. So you, you, they return from the query, but they don't get put into your C-sharp object. Okay. Uh, there's another question over here, I think. Yeah. It's kind of related to that, but okay. like, uh, from like, uh, new users who are trying to use Couch. Um, couch base. Common uh, problem when when you execute query and let's say you're casting it instead of dynamic into a person yeah. to have some kind of casting conversion you know, errors because you're trying to take like a, a structure in JSON that doesn't match your C sharp. You know, yeah. Or, yeah. So yeah. Uh, so the question is basically about you know is there going to be a problem if I have a C sharp object that has different types than what the database what the Couchbase is returning? This is a problem I don't think is unique to Couchbase. It's probably Entity Framework and and Hibernate similar sort of problem. Um, so I think probably what would happen is that it's going to try to do its best to put the value into the object. So if you're returning an integer and you're trying to map it to a string, that would probably work okay. Other way around though, probably would wouldn't work. It would probably end up. It wouldn't probably throw an exception. We could try it, but it would probably uh, you know just give you the default value or null instead. Something we could definitely try for sure. Yeah, over here. If you um, since you are select, you're selecting on a particular key, if 
you refer to first name and last name, but it is first underscore name and last underscore name and slide the links in the so the question is, what if I said first underscore name and then the field in C sharp is first name? Again, probably not unique to Couchbase in any the framework. C -sharp, I mean, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Oh. You don't have an oh. Okay. Okay. So okay. So if you're saying select first name and your Couchbase document is first underscore name, right. then it's not going to match. It's basically not going to find. It's going to be uh, undefined result there. So there's, there's no logic that says a first name is the same as first underscore name. You'd have to build that logic in yourself into the query, which you could do. Okay, cool. All right, uh, here's a delete. This is, again, some new C-sharp syntax if you're not comfortable with that. But just bucket.remove with the document ID. Here's what it looks like in old C-sharp syntax. Yep. Okay, uh, so let's get to more complex uh, nickel stuff. Hopefully we can get through some of this. So there is, in Couchbase, if you install, when you install Couchbase, there'll be a sample bucket, several, available to you to install. It has a bunch of real data in it that you can play around with and, and try to learn nickel. One of them is called Travel Sample. It contains a lot of uh, travel information like airlines and routes and landmarks and things like that. This is kind of showing off a couple things. One is a parameterization, which is important. But two is that we have a union in, in SQL. So this is, a, this is a full SQL implementation. We have unions and joins and uh, uh, merges and all kinds of cool stuff. So in this case, I just want to find all the routes um, for, for two different airports. So a from and a to. If I ran this in my, uh, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. That's the annotation. The annotation? In the, oh, this, this up here? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, C-sharp syntax. That just means give me a multi-line string. Yeah, that's the at symbol up there in front of the uh, string. I think that's a C-sharp 4 or C-sharp 3. They introduced that, I think. Yeah, OK. Um, and that, so, OK, so here, if I ran this query in uh, uh, Query Workbench in my Couchbase console, which we'll see a little more in action here, it's going to union these together. It's going to get this as the result. So here we have an uh, a array of JSON objects. And there's the first one, there's the second one. And you can see it's a little more complex than just a couple of fields. We have now this uh, geolocation field in there, which contains lat, lawn, and altitude. And so it, it's, uh, it's uniting them together into one result there. And uh, let's see. I can also click on this table icon here to get more of a flat table-like view of the data, which sometimes is helpful, sometimes it's not. But you can see that basically this is kind of like a, a table within a table. It's a, it's a sub-document in there. But that might be an easier way for you to visualize what's going on sometimes. We'll see some more of that in action. Here's an even more complex example showing some joins and this thing called unnest, which is unique to JSON data. And I'm going to get into this one here a little more interactively, but I wanted to show it to you on screen here. We're trying to find all the flights for a given day of the week. So like on Sunday, give me all the flights that go from uh, Columbus to New York. Columbus is where I'm from, so it's kind of relevant to me. So let me go ahead and show this to you. Uh, you guys aren't seeing that, are you? Duplicate. All right, so would one of you guys let me know if I'm getting close on time, because I think the clock up here is inaccurate. Uh, this example, yes, okay. So inside of Couchbase Console, that's kind of washed out, isn't it? There's all kinds of neat little bevels and lines here that you guys can't really see, but um, this is just kind of like your, you know, your SQL Studio management sort of thing. You can put in a query here and get the results. So I'm going to paste a simple one in here. I'm going to select everything from the travel sample bucket, which, you know, Make sure I actually have installed here. That might be important. I don't. So give that a second here to run. Forgot to install that today. Um, OK. So uh, I'm going to select all these fields from the travel sample bucket. And I have alias travel sample as R. Um, so I'm selecting R.field, R.field, et cetera. Right? 
And then I'm, give, give me all the documents where r.sourceAirport equals, in this case, San Francisco, and destination equals Miami. All right, so it's going to return every document that has, that matches those criteria, and map them into uh, alias r. All right, we'll see if we can execute this. We're still building the index for the travel sample. I apologize for not doing this earlier. Okay. And then there's the result down there at the bottom, which might be hard for you to see. Oops. Um, but there is the JSON example. So these are route documents, and they have these fields, airline ID, destination airport. They also have this schedule, which is an array of objects. So it's, you know, this is more complex than you'd see in a typical row of a database table. And we have multiple of these documents. So let's go to the table view, for instance. Maybe a little better to visualize this. So there's one row, there's the second row, and there's the third row. So we've got three airlines that have routes from San Francisco to Miami. Yeah? So I'm going to have straight up the CL saving with all this. I'm going to have straight up the CL saving with all this. Am I, am I saving this data into SQL Server? I, I, don't, I don't quite understand the question. This is, this is not SQL Server, this is Couchbase Server. Yeah, SQL Server is not involved. This is, this is no SQL, right? Okay, and uh, okay, so this gives us some information about uh, the routes here. This has an airline ID of airline 439. So, not terribly interesting. We don't know what airline that is. So we need to join that to another document to see what the name of the airline is. So if I bring over this code here, I can paste that in. Now I can say, OK, we're going to join to the same bucket, also called travel sample. I'm going to alias that as A in this case. I want to join on documents that have the key that match airline ID. So think of that kind of like a foreign key. So airline 439, and I want to map those into A. And then up here, I'll say, it will give me the name field from those airline documents. So is it United, is it American, Southwest, etc. So execute that, and there we go. First one is American Airlines. Second one is US Airways. And the third one is not there. I don't know if they did this on purpose, but it's because that key doesn't exist. So I have to do a left join. And now I get three rows, so no name on that one. American Airlines and US Airways. Okay? So a join. Pretty, um, you know, pretty uncommon in NoSQL databases to see that sort of thing, but there you go. Any questions on that so far? So the question was, is SQL the only way to access, like, to run queries basically in Couchbase? So I mentioned early on the MapReduce. You can write MapReduce functions to, to write queries, which are fine in some cases. It's basically writing in JavaScript. Sometimes it might be easier to write complex logic in JavaScript than it is in, to write in SQL. So that's going to be up to you. I prefer this because I've been using SQL my whole life. <laughs> so what about C Sharp? Um, OK, so the .NET SDK I don't think provides any any complex um, any complex syntax for that, but I will show you something else uh, in addition to the SDK here soon that will allow you to write some cool things in C sharp. That, <laughs> you beat me. You beat me too, man. Yeah, that's that's a surprise. Oh, there's a link provider for this too. Yes, I'll get to that for sure. You guys are just antsy. Okay, here we go. Uh, all right, so now this schedule field here is this embedded table in each row, which might be fine. We might be able to work with that. But suppose I want to flatten it out. I want to basically join this main, this main document to its sub-documents. So just to break it from result 3 into result like, you know, 100, whatever. So that's where this unnest keyword comes into play. I'm going to take that field, schedule, and I want to unnest it which is basically like a join, but it's a special join in that it's a join to a JSON sub-document. So when I execute that, what do you think you're going to see? You're going to see something that looks like this. 
much like the results of a join, right? So a lot of the same fields repeated, but now the flight numbers are different, and also the times are different. So now instead of th uh, three results or two results, I have 52 results. There's American Airlines, and there's U.S. Airways. Okay, yeah. Oh, uh, ooh, good question. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to have to look into that. So like a left unnest, what you be looking for? Right, if there were no yeah. I don't know. I can find out. That sounds like a good blog post to write. So thank you. <laughs> um, my guess is there's probably something there, or at very least it would return just an undefined for a flight and UTC. I don't know. It's a really good question. Okay, and then finally, we want to finish this up. We only want the ones on a certain day. So let's just say Sunday, which is day zero, I guess, in travel, travel world. So here we go. We have all the flights from San Francisco to Miami on Sunday. Here are their flight numbers. Here are their times. There we go. So any more questions on nickel? How are we doing on time? Oh, my time's right? What time? Do I, how long do I have to go? So 12? Okay. I think we'll get through this. We have time for questions. Uh, I'm going to be around here, so if you have questions, I can definitely talk to you. But uh, hopefully we'll have time for questions. We're, we're almost near the end here, I think. So I've got the full... Oh, this is the wrong screen. Just see my secret notes. Uh, so the full REST example I showed you today, I didn't show you every piece of code in that example, but you can go find it on GitHub at Couchbase Labs. There's one for .NET and Angular. There's also ones for Node and Java and all kinds of cool stuff on Couchbase Labs, so go and check that out on GitHub. Uh, if you're interested in Nickel, we have an online interactive Nickel tutorial. that You can basically write real queries against the Couchbase bucket. Now, some things are disabled because otherwise it would be a security problem. Uh, but you can go in there and uh, write queries and play with it and follow the instructions. It's some very cool stuff there. Highly recommend checking that out. Now, you already spoiled my surprise here. Link to Couchbase. There is an open source project. It's not officially supported by Couchbase yet, but we do have some contributors to the project linked to Couchbase. We don't have ORMs because we don't have, you know, it's non-relational data. We do have something called an ODM, which is an object data model. So linked to Couchbase is one for .NET. We have Ottoman, which is one for Node. And um, I think that might be it. I don't know if Java has one. So I could write a POCO like this, for instance, to I want to map... Um, I guess these are airlines. And so I could say just map, just you know, create these fields that correspond to the uh, fields in an airline document. Now I've put this JSON property in here because uh, those JavaScript guys like to use um, camel case and us .NET guys like to use Pascal case. And then up there, document type filter, I've said this is an airline. Put that in string. So that's optional. We'll see why in a second here. If I include JSON or I include link to Couchbase, I can write something like this. I can say bucket.query, query for airlines, and then I can uh, say give me the airline name, for instance, select, select x.name. I could do uh, where's on this. I could do, um, you know, your, your standard link stuff. Um, now, I have this, I've got this where x.type equals airline crossed out because I put this document type filter on there. Link to Couchbase says, okay, I know that you're looking for documents that have a field type that equals airline. So you don't have to tell me that explicitly. I'll just assume that. If you don't put that attribute on there, you're going to have to write this line. Otherwise, it's going to try to map everything into an airline document, and that just doesn't make sense. It's going to try to map a, a route into an airline, and it's not going to work. So Link to SQL introduces some opinions into how you store your data, but it also gives you some cool link syntax. Okay, I think that's all the Couchbase stuff I have, uh, Couchbase server stuff. I do ha I want to touch on mobile really quickly because it's a really cool thing that we offer, an embedded database for devices, mobile devices, IoT, and so on, kind of like a, a, a drop-in for SQLite. You can write to that data database locally. We have a cool thing when, when that phone is connected to the Internet, you can actually sync between the you know, Couchbase server or other phones, sync up that data so you can get new data that's come in, you can um, you know, send back new data that you've saved while, while you're offline. So you've got some synchronization options there. And those all hook up to Couchbase Server 
uh, on the cloud side if you want to use that. That's pretty cool. I have a Xamarin example for you. I know Greg Shackles is here, so I had to put this in the slide in. Um, check out the Xamarin example. We also have uh, Android Java examples and iOS examples up there. Again, in Couchbase Labs for some cool mobile stuff. Um, these are the stickers I have. So if you're interested or if you tweeted something, come up and see me. I'll give you one of these cool stickers. You can put on your, besmirch your pristine laptop with them. Uh, Couchbase Connect is our annual conference. It's uh, November 7th through 9th this year. It's in Santa Clara, California. So I know a lot of you guys are going to be f getting the first plane out there. But also, uh, we have some uh, live streaming online. So you can check that out um, even from the comfort of your own, uh, your own New York home. So uh, November 7th through 9th, couchbase.com slash connect. I'm on the developer advocate team. You can find us roaming around in the forums, posting blogs. There's our developer portal. Uh, I'm M. Groves on Twitter. We're always looking for hashtag Couchbase stuff. So if you have a question, comments, or some observation, we're always checking out Twitter for those sorts of things. OK. Is there we any got migration tool uh, to transport data from Access or SQL to Couchbase? So is there any? a tool to transfer from, from a, a SQL database to Couchbase. Um, uh, yeah, I, belie I believe so. Uh, I know there's at least an ODBC driver to go the other way. And, um, you know, it's a blog post I need to, be, need to write, actually, is how to do that, how to go from a SQL database to a Couchbase document. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to vary based on what kind of database you're using and, and how you want to model your data. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Can we get a copy of these slides? Or? You want to copy these slides? Um, I can do that. I think they're on speaker deck or something. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'll tweet about it later. So look at M Groves on Twitter. I'll tweet about that. Okay. I got plenty of time for questions, I guess. So and you guys have lots of them. Yeah. Give a quick idea of pricing for licensing. Pricing for licensing. A oh, good question. So Couchbase is all open source. The Couchbase server is, uh, has an open source and free version called Community Edition, which is uh, it's the standard model. It's, it's like one release behind the Enterprise Edition, but it's totally free for you to use. You don't get any support with it other than, you know, forums. My answer to your questions. Totally free. Um, some features are available only in Enterprise Edition, but uh, LinkedIn, for instance, I think uses Community Edition. So definitely free. Uh, Free versions out there, but hey, I, I need to, I need to eat. Just buy buy a license. No, whatever. Uh, another question. Yeah. How does your backup process work? Because if you're talking about you should have multiple nodes. So yeah. Say you have data stored on one node. You have three nodes, and one of your nodes goes down. Yeah. Now you have only two nodes left. Yeah. But what does the date on that node that went down happen? Okay. Okay. So the question is, uh, if I have, say, three nodes, and the data is you know, spread across all three of those nodes, and what happens if one node goes down? Now, when you configure a bucket, you can choose to replicate the data in that bucket up to, uh, I think, three other nodes. So if that bucket goes down, the replica copies are still available. So you could still read them. You can still view those documents. You can't write to them and update them. And the other thing you can do is you can set up what's called failover, which can be done automatically. So if a node goes down and it stays down for some period of time, someone tripped over the power cord or something, after a certain period of time, it'll fail over and say, OK, promote those replicas to be active documents. So now I can start to read and write from, you know, to and from those documents. So there is that replica built in. So there is some period of time where those documents are not available for you to, to write and make changes to while it's failing over. Mm -hmm. Or the discount like yeah. arbitrary. Right. So the, qu the question is, how is the data split amongst the nodes, basically? How is it sharded? So there's a hashing algorithm that's used. I forget what it's called. There's a name for it. Um, but it basically goes off the key of your document. It hashes that key. And there's, I can get into more detail about these things called V buckets. It splits them up by some range of that hash. And those are stored in different parts of uh, the bucket called V buckets. All right. And so those V buckets are known. Their values are known. So we can now, when one fails over, we can say, OK, we need to compensate by creating 
these buckets over here. And I guess so. that same process works when you go multiple. Co locations. Correct. So if you add additional nodes, it also, you know, it re so rebalancing is the process that it's called. Rebalances process, them. Is it across data centers as well? So uh, there is some cross data center replication available. So if you have a data center in New York and one in Los Angeles, you can sync between them. And so say, say my Los Angeles data center goes down, so yeah. only my New York one, so it'll kind yes. of be the same, like you said, it's just a read thing, or will that all be able to uh, Okay, so in that case, it's, it's two different data centers, right? So the data is replicated between them. Um, so if the LA goes down, you can, the New York one is still, you can read and write to it, right? And when the LA comes back up, then it'll start syncing the data between them again. Over here. If I want to migrate from one version of a schema, of an implicit schema to another, yeah. is that something that I have to do client side or can I actually do something server side? So if you want to migrate from one version of a schema to another, so like if a field name changes or you add a new field, um, can you do it client side or server side? So, I mean, if you, want, if you could just write a simple nickel query, like an update, if you consider that server side, you could do that on Couchbase server and say update all these documents, you know, change the name from first name to first underscore name, so or vice take, versa. You can take nickel queries and have them run in Couch in the, in the server itself as opposed to. Well, so they're not stored procedures. Okay. Um, you, you, yeah, you, I guess in that, in that sense, you have to run them as a client, right? Either in the window there, or you could run them as a script. Um, via the REST API I mentioned earlier, or you can run them from your C-sharp application or whatever else. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, over here. So you're not sure whether you need to scale out yet, right, to multiple nodes. Is there some kind of way you can monitor the performance on your nodes? Yes. So can you monitor the performance? Yes. Yeah. So if we go back to that, uh, that's, uh, where was it? Go back to the console here. This thing has some really cool stuff to monitor, like how much RAM you're using, how many operations you're doing. How, you can't see it, can you? Is that in the community edition as well? I believe all of these are in the community edition, yes. I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure these are all in the, in the community edition, yes. And so that, that might give you some idea. There's some other, I mean, we have, you know, you can ask in the forums, like, you know, how big of a cluster do I need for this or, um, you know, how fast a machine do I need for this service or scale out? You know, you can scale out multidimensionally. You can put, you know, most of your nodes can be on commodity machines. Maybe your query service needs to run on a really, really beefy machine because you're running a lot of queries, for instance, or, or vice versa. There's a question over here, yeah. Um, I have uh, two questions about updating data. Is there any notion of concurrency, record locking, and is there any notion of a transaction where I'm updating two uh, buckets, I guess? Or yeah. Okay, so uh, one of the questions was on concurrency. Um, so I think, what, so and the other question was transactions. I think to answer your question, there is no transactions available in Couchbase because of the multi, you know, distributed nature. You'd have to consider locking down, you know, a whole bucket across the board, right? Which just wouldn't would be killing performance. Um, but a, a document itself is atomic. So if you update that, that document, that, that is a transaction in itself, if it's just a single document. So in a lot of cases, you know, relational, you require a transaction because you're modifying four or five tables in one go. And the document, that might, also, that might all be combined into one document. So you can just do the transaction on a single document, you'll be fine there. There is a, something called CAS, which is uh, optimistic locking, I believe. You can, you can use that CAS number to see if it's been updated since I last read it, and then you can keep retrying so you're not worry about overriding somebody else's data or something like that. Yeah. More questions? I'm losing track of who I asked first. Over here. So what is, um, what differentiates Couchbase from like Mongo? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, if you're familiar with Mongo, hopefully you've seen some differentiation already. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to go into a bashing Mongo sort of thing. That's, that's where I'm afraid I would, I would be treading if I talk about this too much. But, you know, I think, I think nickel queries are something that Mongo does not have. It's a pretty cool syntax. If you're comfortable with, with SQL, you can, you can already write nickel queries. Um, you know, uh, the, the Couchbase architecture 
as far as I know, Mongo is sort of a more of a master slave sort of system. And Couchbase is all, you know, everything is, is a master node, right? So there's not a sing, you know, there's not a point of failure that hurts more than any other point of failure. I think that's important as well. Um, you know, if you go to our blog, there are some posts that definitely uh, talk about discussing Mongo in a lot more detail and some, some very important differences, technical differences as well. I don't want to get into too much here because I don't really like to, you know, rag on the competition. <laughs> so, yeah. So the question is, if I have, if I want to do some sort of reporting tool like uh, Crystal or Power BI or or Microsoft what? Microsoft Microsoft reporting services. I think. Microsoft reporting services might be just SQL only. I'm not sure about that. But there are, there are ODBC drivers available. So if it supports ODBC, you can you connect it to ODBC. And I have a whole other talk on uh, SQL for JSON, which goes in more detail and talks about ODBC. And I, I even bring up the old Excel query tool, which gives me some flashbacks to early in my career. But uh, yeah, there's, there's some cool reporting options to use ODBC. There's also some stuff I mentioned earlier that we have some sort of native integrations with those big data tools like Kafka and Spark and so on. So like performance benchmarks and things? Yes. Uh, go to couchbase.com. We, we just released a set of uh, YTS, YTSB, I think, benchmarks, which is like an industry standard benchmark. You can go check that out. Lots of cool benchmark stuff there. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Is that everybody? Over here. If, um, if I write an application where I want to just send this as if it was a database to a user and have an application run on it, so is it just bottled up in a single file? Is the database bottled up in a single file? In other words, um, if I want to create, if I want to create a couch-based database and then distribute it to users so that they can run an application that's looking at the data locally rather than over the web. Hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, so it, you could. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a backup tool, a command line tool to backup and restore databases. You can use that. I think it's CV backup and CV restore. I think you can also export to the raw JSON and then import the raw JSON if you wanted to do that as well, into a single file. You're pretty large, I think. Uh, you can certainly do that. Yeah. So I think the, the, the nickel is pretty exciting, but. Um, you too. So so there's no such thing as stored procedures for Couchbase? That's correct. So the closest thing to a stored procedure would be like a, the MapReduce query. Those are stored on Couchbase. Those are not going to be doing inserts, update, deletes. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no stored procedure per se on Couchbase server. At least not yet. I don't know if that's in the roadmap as a high priority. Yeah, yeah. A lot of this pushes, you know, Right, right. A lot of this pushes out the responsibility of maintaining schemas and, uh, to the, and the power of manipulating the schemas to the developer. So there's definitely a trade-off there. Yeah. You talked about caching at the beginning. And yeah. I mean, if you're reading records or reading documents, essentially, is there a way to uh, cache those on the client side and reuse those, or I mean, would you just handle that on your client side? APS, uh, review yeah, I, yeah. Sure, you could. Use some caching technology in local side to, to store them. You know, .NET has a building cache, or ASP.NET has a building cache. Uh, but actually, Couchbase in a lot of cases is used as a cache when you're scaling out a website because you're you know you're storing and retrieving documents directly from RAM in many cases. So, session store or um, user stores, for instance. A lot of people that's how Couchbase gets introduced into their enterprise. It's not as the primary data storage, but as the uh, session storage. For, for scaling out amongst the web farm. Yeah. I can see where um, during your session about um, administering like uh, passwords and securities mm -hmm. different logins and features. Yeah. So role based security is going to be in the next release of Couchbase. I think four dot no, I don't want to say for sure. But it's on the it's on the if you go it's all open source so you can go check out the um, the tickets there. I think four dot six, four dot seven maybe. Right now we just have, you know, you have the administration login to this console and then each bucket can have a password on it. And um, 
There are some third parties that offer some encryption options for you know, storing Couchbase data encrypted on disk, which doesn't do you a lot of good with SQL injection. So make sure to parameterize your uh, your queries. Whew, because that's a lot of questions. I love it. I'm going to be here the rest of the day. So if you guys think of anything else, come and find me. And uh, if you tweeted or you just really want a sticker, come up and see me afterwards. And I got them right up here for you. Thanks very much. And uh, have fun at uh, camp, boot camp. <laughs>